The painting above tells us a lot about the English psyche at the end of the 16th century. Painted in 1588, the portrait shows Elizabeth sitting in front of the defining moments for England, the defeat of the Spanish Armada in 1588. Here we can see the scenes behind the Queen showing, on the left, the English fire ships setting out in clear, calm weather, and on the right, the Spanish fleet being wrecked off the dark, rocky coast of Scotland and Ireland. It's because of the Armada which had happened in the past behind Elizabeth that Elizabeth's hand reaches into the future and rests on the globe over the Americas, highlighting England's domination of the sea and expansion into the New World. The gradual decline of Spanish sea power gave Elizabeth and later James I confidence to develop trade, especially with the East. The Portuguese and Dutch had a monopoly on trade with the East and between 1590 and 1600 English ships attempted without success to make inroads. In 1600, 242 London merchants agreed to the foundation of the East India Company and in 1601 Captain James Lancaster travelled to India for the first time. With £68,000 worth of funds, including money for ships, plus gold and silver to trade with, Lancaster established a trading post at Bantam on the island of Java. The intention of this lecture is for you to consider how significant the trading companies were to the economic development between 1625 and 1688. Knowledge-wise, you will explain the development of both the East India Company and the Royal African Company. Skills-wise, you will analyse the economic changes between 1625 and 1688. Then behaviourally, evaluate your analysis and apply to forming a substantiated conclusion and the economic development of Britain between 1625 and 1688. When the East India Company arrived, the local rulers were reluctant to trade for British goods, which they had no use for. Instead, they asked for silver, breaking the policy of mercantilism which was in favour of accumulating gold and silver. The East India Company contravened official government policy, but because of its success, this was overlooked. More trading posts were established in the East Indies between 1601 and the 1620s, and the first Indian trading post was not established until 1613. Breaking the Portuguese monopoly over trade with India was proving difficult. In 1623, the East India Company attempted to expel the Dutch from their base on the island of Ambom in modern-day Indonesia. This was a failure and the company officials were executed by the Dutch for the incursion. Activity ended in the East Indies when the company refocused on India. Saltpeter, Potassium nitrate, a key ingredient in fertiliser and gunpowder, arrived from India in 1626 for re-exporting. Pepper was then sold in bulk from 1627 and by 1633 Madras was established as a trading post. Its growth was fast and it became a trade hub for calico textiles made from woven cotton. By 1635 a lasting peace was established with the Portuguese who controlled the region of Goa. This improved greatly the trading conditions on the west coast of India. The 1640s saw continued success, with a trading post in Bajra to support Persian trade interests. However, Oliver Cromwell was suspicious of its royalist sympathies and by 1657 had removed the company's charter to be the sole trader with the east. The restoration, however, saw a new charter with the same privileges and the return of the capital assets to the company of £740,000. The relationship with the Portuguese improved as well when Charles II married Catherine of Berganza in 1662 and her dowry included the island of Bombay which Charles allowed the company to use. Even though Charles II had returned the charter and given permission to use Bombay, he was indebted to the company when it loaned the crown £10,000 in 1660 and £50,000 in 1667. This indebtedness allowed the company to avoid scrutiny over its financial practices. The first shipment of tea arrived in 1664 and the Great Fire of London destroyed large quantities of pepper and other goods. The importance of the company became apparent in 1672 when it was given permission to mint coins in India and in 1675 it produced the Indian rupee. 
All English subjects in India were under the company's authority and its own private army was created to protect citizens and traded interests. They also started to build specialised armoured ships to their own set of specifications. By 1688, it was a popular choice for investment, with profits equaling and often exceeding the Caribbean and North American trade of tobacco and sugar. By the 1680s, profits of no more than £100,000 between 1600 and 1640 had exploded to £600,000. It was the success of the East India Company which meant the English were able to compete with the other major European powers. The idea of triangular trade began in 1510 when the Spanish transported the first 50 slaves to Hispaniola. In the early days, Spain and Portugal dominated the slave trade. In the 16th century, a triangular trade grew drew to the large profits that could be made. Cheap European goods could be traded at lower prices to trading posts in Africa. The slaves transported to the New World and exchanged for the goods which they would eventually sell, such as cotton, tobacco, sugar and mahogany, fetching a far higher price. The first involvement of the British in this trade was by, by Captain John Hawkins in 1562. British merchants were involved in the transportation of slaves. However, in 1640, there were no slaves in the English colonies of North America. By 1660, slavery was written into law in most American colonies. And by 1700, there were nearly 120,000 primarily within the Caribbean colonies, mostly Jamaica and Barbados. The cruelty and barbarity of the treatment of slaves was ignored as slaves were nothing more than property. However, why was this expansion able to take place? Firstly, early in the 17th century, it was the Dutch who controlled most West African trading posts. The Royal Adventurers of England trading in Africa was set up in 1663. This was an ultimately due to the successes of the First Dutch War. Secondly, after the restoration of 1660, Colonies such as Montserrat and Antigua were suffering labour shortages as the number of indentured servants did not fit the need. The triangular trade was mutually beneficial for both English slave traders and plantation owners. Finally, the Royal African Company of 1672 was a refoundation of the 1663 Company, meaning Britain dominated the slave trade into the 18th century with Britain's abolition of the trade. Like the East India Company, the Royal African Company could levy its own army, set up bases and trading posts. Technological advances in weapons and ships ensured its control into the 18th century. The profits made from the huge numbers of slaves transported after 1660 added massively to the wealth of the City of London. The gold taken from Africa was used in the Royal Mint, emboldening the British economy. Liverpool and Bristol became centres for the slave trade and the trade grew even after the Dolores Revolution of 1688. William III breaks the Royal African Company's monopoly when he allows all English merchants to trade in African goods and slaves. In compensation, the Royal African Company was granted the right to supply the Spanish possessions in South America in 1713, meaning Britain controlled almost half the entire transatlantic slave trade. The Royal African Company's strength in the City of London is also important. 15 Lord Mayors of London, 25 Sheriffs and 38 Aldermen between 1660 and 1690 were shareholders. Also, the Guinea coin, named after the place where Britain's gold and slave supply was located, was minted in 1663 using 22 carats of gold. Worth £1 and 1 shilling, so £1 and 5 pence in modern money, one of these original guinea coins would reach in excess of £40,000 if put up for auction today. The massive economic changes which transformed Britain were yet to happen in the 18th and 19th century. Nevertheless, it is clear the fundamental foundations of that transformation was achieved in the years 1625 to 1688. Agricultural techniques increased output and cash crops such as hemp and flax were indispensable to the textile industries. 
Even the crops from the colonies improved the economic conditions of Britain, with tobacco and sugar becoming vastly profitable. London's new role as the centre of European trade and commerce ensured Britain's long-term prosperity that even fire could not stop. Finance was available and the acquisition of credit meant merchants were to invest into new ventures and trading companies. The rivalry with the Dutch runs throughout this period. The British textile industry, once dominated by the Low Countries, sees a resurgence and growth as a result of the new draperies in the towns of East Anglia. Mercantilism enables Britain to compete with Holland internationally. The application of mercantilism is supported and protected by the passing of the Navigation Acts, enforcing English supremacy at sea and the growth and prosperity of the Northern American colonies. We also see the beginning of the monopoly and control of the triangular trade at the expense of Portugal and Spain. However, it can be argued that mercantilism was not necessary in North America and the Caribbean as England was only a trading partner and the acts caused resentment to the London-based government. For example, in New England, the Navigation Acts were routinely ignored and they traded with other European powers. Generally, economic development was strong and there was correlation between population growth and economic progress. However, there was still a conservative approach to aspects of the royal economy. The continuation of the pudding out system and the lack of agricultural progress in some areas means the benefits and developments were not felt by everyone. This is clearly evident in Ireland, which saw little industrial investment and as a result saw no benefits of improved agricultural techniques until much later. The issues which were seen in the Irish Rebellion of 1641 and the fighting between Catholics and Protestants with the obvious favouritism towards Protestants was not addressed after the Restoration and can be said to be ignored well into the 20th century. The limited changes to transport and industry was clearly piecemeal. Turnpikes appeared at the end of the century and water transport was mostly unreliable and disrupted by seasonal changes and bad weather. The heavy industry, which will be the backbone of the Industrial Revolution, was virtually non-existent. The well-established industries of coal and tin were present However, the processes by which they were extracted were slow and inefficient. Without the complete redevelopment of the economy towards the mass production techniques of the 18th and 19th century, Britain's economy was transformed, but not to the powerhouse it will become. However, certainly it has the embryonic budding of future strength and power, which by 1688 was still not guaranteed to develop. Nevertheless, Unlike 1625, by 1688 the pieces were in place to call Checkmate in the 18th century. The intention of this lecture was for you to consider how significant the trading companies were to the economic development between 1625 and 1688. Knowledge wise, you are now able to explain the development of both the East India Company and the Royal African Company. Skills wise, you will analyse the economic changes between 1625 and 1688 in the associated material. Then behaviourally, in the associated material you will evaluate the analysis and apply to form a substantiated conclusion on the economic development of Britain between 1625 and 1688.